गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी आई डॉक्टर ज्ञानेन्द्र शर्मा एक्सटेंड अ वॉर्म वेलकम टू ऑल मेम्बर्स ऑफ सिद्धेश्वर यूरोलॉजी सोसायटी एज वेल एज टू अवर चीफ ओरेटर टूडे डॉक्टर मयंक मोहन अगरवाल एंड डॉक्टर कीर्ति सबनेस फॉर बींग पार्ट ऑफ अ वेरी इम्पॉर्टेंट सी एम ई एंड वी आर रियली प्रिवलेज दैट वी आर हैविंग अ गुड नंबर ऑफ अटेंडेंस राइट एट द बिगनिंग डॉट ऑन टाइम वो आर ऑनलाइन ऑल्सो इट्स अ वेरी इम्पॉर्टेंट आस्पेक्ट दैट इज यूरोसेप्सिस i i remember meeting uh, dr uh, mayank at hyderabad in one of the conferences uh, where both of us were speakers and he gave a talk on how to prevent urosepsis and i discussed that i give a single shot of antibiotic to lot of patients with ureterinoscopy and pcnl but over a period of time especially post covid this scenario has changed the antibiotic resistance pattern that we are seeing in many of the cultures that we get we are doing is shocking to say the least and uh, it raises a very serious issue that will we be staring at a situation where we will be having patients with infection but no antibiotic would be useful because if we look at the last 20 years probably not more than one or two antibiotic has come on the horizon and if we look at our data also what is the incidence of sepsis i was just trying to look at how many patients had fever so it comes to less than 3 or 3.5% in the last one year but one patient who develops infection it's is enough to take away few precious minutes of your life uh, that is the amount of stress a urosurgeon undergoes and i am sure all urologists would agree with that so i should give credit for this particular topic to dr sanjay deshpande sir the senior urologist from sholapur and also to dr pankaj whose brains i keep on picking off and on and uh, probably harass him much more than anybody else yeah um we decided that we will have two talks one on how to prevent and second on how to treat infection following endo urological procedures and we have involved the prominent microbiologists as well as intensivists from our city so that we can have a good discussion where we can really come up with some ideas guidelines if not for the state if not for the country but at least for our district which we can adhere very religiously and bring down the level of antibiotic resistance i now hand over the mic to dr ta uh for giving a brief overview and uh, introducing dr mayank good evening everyone on behalf of siddeshwar urological society i welcome all of you for this monthly meeting of siddeshwar urology society as we, um, many of us are new they are not aware we conduct every monthly meeting of siddeshwar urology society and we have uh, webinars we have case discussion interesting case discussions and uh, we have this religious uh, activity going on since many years uh, on every thursday of every month so uh, today we have a very interesting topic for uh, discussion which we all encounter uh, quite frequently that is uh, urosepsis and we have a very wonderful um, uh, faculty today evening we have uh, two guest speakers will be talking we have a uh, wonderful panel from our uh, in house panel com comprising of microbiologists and intensivists so we'll be having uh, i i am quite sure that we'll be having a wonderful session so without wasting time i'll just hand over i'll uh, introduce our speakers so our first speaker is uh, dr mayank mohan agarwal sir sir is basically uh, has done his mch urology has done his mch training from pgi chandigarh and sir is also a gold medalist in uh, national board of urology sir has uh, has been awarded fellowships he has visited and worked with stalwarts in mskcc ucla and during his tenure in pgi chandigarh he has worked as an assistant and associate professor he has authorized uh, more than 85 research articles in international peer reviewed journals and he has written a chapter in uh, smith's endourology 
and has also written a manual of urodynamics based on his years of clinical and research experience in this field. He has a lot of study in lower intra dysfunction and he has introduced novel concepts in flow volume nomograms that is uh, PGI mere nomograms and flow volume index in urophilometry. A novel continent cutaneous urinary diversion uh, pad, which is very uh, popular as PGI mere pouch is accredited to his team. He has been awarded as top reviewer of, of the Gold Journal in 2016. He has been invited by several national and international conferences and for delivering lectures. He has 17 years of extensive clinical experience in endourology, advanced urological laparoscopy, urooncology, advanced urodynamics, female urology, and neurourology. And currently, sir, is working as associate director of urology in Medanta Medicity, Lucknow. So I hand over the session to Mayank Mohan Agarwal, sir. Sir, you please continue with your talk. Yeah, thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. Um, I will just start. The... Yeah. So my um, topic is infection prevention and antibiotic prophylaxis in endourology. So... Um, uh, for whenever we talk about prevention of infection, we talk about control of our environment, control of personnel, uh, patient as well as healthcare worker, and the control of equi uh, equipment. So I will not be talking about the environment now. It's a separate topic. So for uh, uh, control of personal equipment, so we will be talking about hand hygiene, uh, which is for surgery related, then instrument reprocessing principles and antibiotic prophylaxis. It will be uh, focused on endourology only. So for uh, hand hygiene, you have either a surgical hand hygiene or a general hand hygiene. So concentrating on the surgical hand hygiene, uh, it can be done uh, either with surgical scrub with medicated soap or by hand rub. So hand rub using alcohol is, uh, um, is a well-established uh, alternative method uh, uh, to a hand wash uh, and it uh, provides certain advantages. The hand wash needs a sink, clean water, a disposable towel, a hand dryer, time and compliance. So it was um, examined that per day nursing time, if the hand wash was done, 16% of the time would go into hand hygiene. And if the hand rub was done, only 4% would go for hand hygiene. Uh, there is, uh, although there is a, um, you can say, uh, uh, there is a notion that uh, using a lot of hand rub uh, makes the skin dry, irritating and all that. However, actually it's the opposite. It's the uh, uh, the soap which denudes the skin, causes micro cuts. And once you apply alcohol on such a hand, then it causes the irritation. So um, using hand hygiene, uh, uh, the most... Uh, 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 commonly used uh, uh, rub is alcohol rub. We use 70% of uh, uh, rub, which is effective against gram-positive and negative uh, bacteria, enveloped viruses, uh, mycobacteria, but poorly effective against spores, fungi, and non-enveloped viruses. Uh, almost same thing goes to chlorhexidine. And one more question, uh, uh, point to remember for chlorhexidine, that Klebsiella and Pseudomonas Selective and uh, to some extent, acinetobacter selectively grow in chlorhexidine. So it is not um, a great uh, or excellent um, uh, choice. However, the advantage of chlorhexidine is this, uh, the uh, the effect remains for prolonged period. So for long surgery, sometimes chlorhexidine, uh, if if we combine with betadine, uh, it works well. Then comes povidone iodine is a, a broad spectrum uh, antimicrobial but it is irritant to the skin. Whenever we are going for surgical uh, hand hygiene, I, I don't know what is the status there. I have seen people having all this in their hands and uh, even surgeons uh, uh, have had experience that they will not remove this uh, auspicious kalava or the, uh, the precious ring or uh, other paraphernalia. And obviously that is against the principles of uh, uh, surgical hand hygiene or even for nursing hand hygiene. Uh, now, coming back to the topic of hand rub versus hand scrub. In 2017, even WHO has accepted hand rub as an accepted uh, mode of surgical uh, hand hygiene. Um, 
so the uh, the dictum is suppose you have many uh, lined up cases in a day so what you do is you do about 40 to 60 seconds of hand wash using either medicated or unmedicated uh, soap for 40 to 60 seconds so that you are able to remove all the vegetative matter and spores from the hand followed by you dry your hands and then before the first case you uh, do surgical hand rub uh, using 70% alcohol now um, uh, the duration is still controversial, but the minimum duration for surgical hand rub is 90 seconds. So there itself is saving time. Um, uh, the optimum period is about two to three minutes. If there are multiple cases lined up, then you don't need to do hand wash uh, before uh, hand rub in subsequent cases. Unless you have done activities like uh, eating, smoking, going to toilet, etc. And uh, it has been proven uh, in many meta-analysis, even uh, in clinical as well as microbiological studies, there is no significant difference between the microbiological flora after hand rub or hand scrub. We can see in this forest plot in a meta-analysis, uh, the this big black line, uh, this quadrangle is uh, almost uh, to the midline and uh, the P value is uh, insignificant. It shows that uh, hand rub is equivalent to hand scrub. So instead of uh, trying to do hand scrub uh, with water and not complying properly, uh, it's better you do a hand rub properly and it takes less time. And for endurological procedure, anyway, you don't need it beyond that. There are studies even for orthopedic implant surgery that 10 minute uh, conventional hand scrub is actually counterproductive. Uh, and a five minute hand scrub is equivalent to three minutes of uh, hand rub. Now coming to instrument reprocessing, um, um, a lot of uh, uh, discussions happen that uh, when we do RARS, a lot of in infections we are seeing. So wh why is it so? My simple and uh, clear, simple answer is, do you brush your teeth or you do you mouthwash? So obviously we brush our teeth. We don't mouthwash uh, every day. So that means, it's a similar thing goes to our instruments. We have to understand that after each use, you have to uh, clean your instrument mechanically by using brushes. Now, nobody can say that uh, uh, for thin channel, how do we brush? Brushes are available for every size uh, instrument. Whatever instrument is available, it comes with a cleaning brush. And once a brush goes bad, you have a, a facility of buying a new brush. All you need is intention. So once you are able to reprocess the channel properly, the chances of infection will drastically come down. I've had a lot of experiences with uh, and com uh, personal communication with my colleagues who have changed this practice and uh, uh, have uh, uh, come out of infections. Infections will happen. That's the nature of the uh, procedure because the infection is there in the stone itself. Uh, but a lot of pathologic uh, pathological uh, issues like sepsis and uh, significant uh, uh, urinary tract infections, they can be reduced, multi drug resistant infections. And uh, we should not forget uh, things like non-tubercular mycobacterial infections, which typically grow in uh, the biofilms of side rays, which are uh, uh, remaining unclean uh, for uh, times together. And every 10, 15 days, we get one patient from outside who is uh, discharging sinus post PCNL done somewhere. And this patient is in a soup because these are typically resistant bacteria, very difficult to grow. So we don't know the uh, antibiotic uh, sensitivity and uh, they are uh, they have to undergo uh, radical surgery for wide excision and some empirical anti-tubercular, anti-microbacterial, uh, which has to uh, go for six to eight months. So instrument reprocessing, uh, I must uh, uh, re-emphasize, although as urologists, we must know that we have to dismantle all the instrument uh, uh, piece, whether it's laparoscopy, you have to dismantle all the three parts. Uh, if it's endourology, you have to dismantle the channels connections and then brush uh, the each channel. You have to train your uh, technician or nurse or whosoever is doing the cleaning the CSSD, that they have to, have to, have to, if this one thing we can uh, take care, 
all other things become secondary. So dismantling, decontamination, pre-cleaning, cleaning, rinsing, drying, sterilization, and storage. These are the steps. Uh, please remember, uh, they look like many steps, but it's just that uh, uh, it's the same day-to-day -day stuff. You, you, the, the way you treat your mouth, you can use the you can use the same simile for your instruments. Uh, ultrasonic cleaner, although um, uh, it is difficult to uh, uh, put your uh, telescope. Uh, particularly the rod lens telescope in a ultrasonic cleaner, but it is 16 times more effective in uh, uh, cleaning the, uh, in decontaminating the surface, removing the blood and other tissues stuck between at, in the joints. But anyway, even if you are not using ultrasonic cleaner, just brushing uh, will be sufficient. Then coming to definitions of sterilization and disinfection. Uh, sterilization uh, is uh, uh, any method which will remove all sorts of uh, uh, live or spore form or vegetative form from the surface. So sterilization, disinfection are for inanimate things and asepsis is for uh, animate things. So for sterilizing, you can see that uh, even spores are uh, killed uh, uh, with the surety of uh, one million. One in a million uh, only should be ineffective. Then comes disinfection. Any method which is not killing the spores is called disinfection. Out of these high level disinfection, which we commonly use in our uh, practice for endourology, uh, will kill everything else but the spores. Uh, intermediate and low level disinfectants are not recommended uh, methods for, uh, for uh, disinfecting uh, endoluminal instrument. Even for GI scopes, now the West is switching towards at least high level disinfection, if not sterilization. So let alone our sterile tract, uh, which is a low urinary tract and upper urinary tract, we should not uh, uh, accept anything less than high level disinfection. And the spores can be taken care of by mechanical cleaning. Steam sterilization, nowadays uh, many scopes are there which are uh, uh, amenable, which are uh, uh, compatible with high temperature, high pressure uh, uh, sterilization uh, for open instrument, laparoscopic, telescopes, long channels, all these things, uh, uh, steam sterilization is effective. But uh, for practical purposes, we don't use this for uh, our endourology instruments. Then coming to low temperature sterilization, which is the most commonly uh, used in uh, uh, I would say maybe in the government setups or uh, the large hospitals who can afford these uh, low temperature steam formaldehyde LTSF, the H2O2 plasma sterilization like steroid system and uh, ETO, which is most commonly used uh, in small setups because of its cheap, uh, cheap uh, installation process. These are all very effective methods of sterilization. All tend to clear the one, one in a million uh, effectiveness, uh, which is called sterilization effectiveness uh, index. Uh, but we should remember that ETO, although it's very cheap, but it is a very toxic gas. It is carcinogenic, it is highly inflammable, and uh, uh, it is teratogenic. So uh, that is the reason that despite a short contact time, which is 60 to 90 minutes, it needs 12 to 14 hours or of wash off period. Uh, in which uh, uh, the degassing the uh, it has to go away from the instrument because otherwise, uh, if you use the ETO un um, un uh, cleaned instrument uh, into the body, it will be toxic for the uh, person. So that is why ETO cannot be used for short, uh, quick uh, uh, re-sterilization. Uh, whereas LTSF plasma etc can be used for that. So then uh, the most commonly used uh, chemical immersion method, which are effective high level disinfections, but not uh, 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 necessarily sterilization, except for parasafe. Uh, parasafe is parasitic acid based uh, chemical sterilization, which is a very short uh, sterilization time, uh, 10 to 20 minutes for sterilization and uh, only 10 minutes for high level disinfection. Uh, the more commonly used uh, agent is Cydex, uh, which is uh, glutaraldehyde or Cydex OPA, ophthalaldehyde. But we should remember that these are uh, the first two are not practically sterilization. Uh, sterilization. 
because for uh, cydex it's 10 hours which is uh, not, uh, i mean not practical for any sterilization process so best we are doing is high level disinfection and uh, cydex tends to form uh, biofilm uh, uh, if if the tray is not clean uh, the uh, the disadvantage of cydex which is actually advantage of parasafe is that cydex uh, can stay for 14 days uh, whereas parasafe has to be made every day so the chances of biofilm formation are less because every day you are uh, emptying it out and uh, making a new solution uh the parasafe is also better in the sense that the uh, effluent is non toxic to you and the environment whereas cydex is uh, in, uh, is which is glutaraldehyde is toxic now uh, formalin chamber uh, nursing homes they use it very frequently even some uh, hospitals also use it i i will strongly uh, discourage use of formalin not because it is not effective but uh, because of its non standardized nature we don't know how many pills to be used maybe 10 to 15 we don't know how frequent changes maybe 7 to 10 days how much time we should keep it for at least 24 hours for disinfection and 96 hours for sterilization but what is the common practice you complete a case whether you have dried or not nobody knows you just put the instrument in the tray and uh, you take it to another place and just take the instrument out and use it oh, absolutely it is uh, it is to be discouraged uh, in 2023 uh, because it is irresponsibility towards our medical profession penetration into lumens is uh, uniformly poor uh, it is toxic pulmonary uh, pulmonary toxicity and carcinogenicity is there uh, one thing i must uh, uh, re emphasize for channel instruments uh, which are essentially every endurology particularly flexible scopes or even uh, 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 rigid ureteroscopes or even for uh, that matter cystoscope when you dip the instrument you have to make sure that you have dipped the instrument completely and you have flushed the channel with the uh, with the whatever disinfectant you are using um uh, we and you have to tell this to your technicians or nurses because they assume that once you dip the instrument uh, the the chemical will also go inside the channel it is it does not happen it's a basic principle of uh, uh, the surface tension it will not go you have to make it go inside and unless you flush the channel with the sterilization sterilizant you will not uh, be able to sterilize the channel which is the most important area to be done there now uh, coming to the antibiotic prophylaxis in surgery for clean and clean contaminated surgery uh, it is called prophylaxis when we have uh, uh, sterile cultures for a contaminated and dirty infected we are actually treating the infection not uh, uh, doing any prophylaxis uh, our endourology procedure uh, are clean contaminated procedures so uh, what are the principles of antibiotic prophylaxis we have to choose well based on which is the organism uh, we are uh, possibly going to en uh, encounter what is the local antibiogram and what is the immunity level of the patient we should ideally choose an antibiotic with long half life like ceftriaxone is preferred over cefepirazone because the half life of ceftriaxone is about 6 to 12 hours compared to 1 to 2 hours of cefepirazone uh, we have to give a loading dose typically a double dose like ceftriaxone 2 g rather than 1 g for a normal person it has to be given within 60 minutes preferably within 30 minutes of incision or uh, insertion whichever is uh, relevant except for uh, slowly given antibiotics like vancomycin or fluoroquinones where 2 hours is uh, expect accepted repeat the antibiotic if the procedure is longer than about 2 uh, two half lives of the antibiotic given and if the blood loss uh, is uh, to the tune of more than 1500 for an adult and 500 for a child most of the time antibiotics can be stopped within 24 hours and uh, i understand the apprehension of people that uh, you know our patients are dirty our ots are not clean and this reason and that reason and it was very dirty system but we have to understand most of the time antibiotics can be stopped under most circumstances within 24 hours any antibiotics we are giving beyond that under most circumstances are not going to reduce the incidence of infection but they are going to increase the incidence of resistance of antibiotic infections are uh, are a nature of uh, the endourology 
and whether you uh, give antibiotic prophylaxis beyond 24 hours or not they are going to happen in certain cases uh, so uh, uh, it is an outdated concept and don't uh, uh, continue uh, antibiotic till removal of drain removal of catheter till removal of stents all these things are have been proven time and again wrong and unless uh, you have a very special case like rheumatic heart disease patients uh, who have who you have sent on uh, uh, anti uh, on on a foreign body it, and so on but not for everyone uh, one very common uh, uh, you know use of antibiotic is elderly person on a catheter and you put him on uh, some sort of a prophylaxis it is not good high risk patients like diabetic extremes of ages obese malnourished smokers alcoholic otherwise immunosuppressed Coexisting infection, etc., etc. It's written here. Uh, you may repeat uh, antibiotic for up to 24 hours. Uh, these are the patients who are at a high risk of infection. It does not mean that more duration of antibiotic is going to work better. Even for a kidney transplant patient, uh, there is a, a very nice study which which has compared a single dose of cefazolin before the incision versus a 10 day of piperacillin test. 10 day starting. Three days prior, nephrologists have a very common practice of starting cleansing the patient uh, starting three days prior and continue for seven days. There is no difference uh, in the SSI. There is no difference in UTI. The only difference is if the UTI happens, the 10-day guy will get a very resistant infection compared to the single dose cefazolin guy. Now, for uh, let's let's go um, uh, about few uh, procedures. Transurethral dissection of prostate. So people have studied whether uh, antibiotics are required or not. So one answer is uh, there that definitely yes, uh, antibiotics are required in transurethral dissection of prostate. It reduces significantly the incidence of UTI and the incidence of sepsis. Now, how long? So whether to give single dose, up to four doses or extended, like seven to 10 days uh, period. So people have studied that and uh, uh, it is there that uh, short duration, which is more than a single dose, typically 24 hours, is better than a single dose. So we can see this blue line, which uh, shows a reduction in infection uh, uh, by a single dose is to the tune of about 57%. Whereas reduction in infection by uh, antibiotic up to four doses. So uh, the limitation is there is no... Uh, I mean, uh, all these studies which are there, uh, they have used different uh, uh, protocols and this is the meta-analysis data. But uh, the most consistent is a short duration antibiotic. Uh, most of these is 24 hours of antibiotics. Up to 48 hours of antibiotics, they provide almost 70% of uh, uh, protection and very little additional protection is given by uh, adding antibiotic for up to 10 days. Now, uh, although it looks numerically higher, that green and orange, but the um, uh, of confidence interval in this group is very broad. You can see like this much, whereas confidence interval of this is very consistently narrow. So uh, uh, it's a statistical concept. If you have a confidence interval very narrow, so that's a more reliable uh, data compared to those who, uh, which have a very wide uh, confidence interval. So practically speaking, there is no difference and anyway, this uh, two and three statistical significance was not achieved. In fact, uh, uh, there is a very interesting study uh, by Baton et al. Uh, in which they have uh, seen antibiotics for a preoperative culture sterile patients who are not on catheter. They found a very low infection complication, rate, only 2.9% in patients without a preoperative uh, antibiotics. So they have questioned whether do we need uh, antibiotic prophylaxis in uncomplicated, less than 50 gram sterile culture, not a high-risk patient. Uh, so uh, that's a food for thought. So that means at least we know that uh, most of the time we don't need antibiotic uh, beyond 24 hours or maximum of 48 hours, even in a case of TORP. A special case apart that one can individualize, but uh, we can still reduce the antibiotic use by 70 to 80% cases. Then coming to TURBT, for a straightforward TURBT, 
uh, studies have proven uh, there is no difference of uh, whether to give antibiotic or not. And uh, this is a this is the concluding remark of a meta analysis that uh, in this systematic review and meta analysis, insufficient evidence supporting antibiotic prophylaxis in postoperative UTI in case of T or B T was found. So again, we have to individualize, but uh, what it's trying to say is most of the time we don't need antibiotics. So uh, if at all you have to use, uh, please stop within 24 hours. Now, PCNL is a special case because uh, it is a very, uh, uh, typically nowadays when you do PCNL, it, these are for large, dirty stones, etc. So um, if we go by stone score, in which we give uh, scoring to the location of stone, the number of stones, the size of stones, presence of hydronephrosis and infection. So for low risk patients, studies have found less than two centimeters, single stone, sterile culture, non-diabetic patient, even uh, antibiotic don't make a difference in uh, post-operative infective complications. Others with sterile culture, single dose antibiotic is better than no antibiotic. In infected case, uh, studies have uh, proven that uh, three to seven days of pre-operative antibiotics reduce the risk of infective complication, including sepsis. However, this uh, um, uh, does not, uh, uh, but, but if you give antibiotic not before the surgery, but continue for seven days after surgery, that is not found to be uh, useful. So treat well before uh, and, and then after, once you remove the source of infection, stop the antibiotic. Uretroscopy principles are same. Uncomplicated, low uretric stones, uh, uh, antibiotics may not be given. Anything more single antibiotic is better than no antibiotics. And uh, uh, most of the time, uh, incidence of pyuria, bacteriuria, and bacteremia have been found to be uh, better when we give antibiotic in anything beyond lower uretic stone. So to conclude, uh, we have to be wise, uh, use hand hygiene uh, uh, properly, keep place and environment clean, process the instrument properly, mechanical cleaning. So two things one must remember, clean the channels, and push the chemical sterilization uh, sterilizant within the channel while dipping. Use antibiotic cautiously and sparingly. And uh, uh, this, these are some uh, principles for reducing the antibiotic. Which, believe me, if you start questioning every use of antibiotic for prophylaxis or for treatment, plan individual case, then there is no chance that uh, uh, you will not be able to reduce the antibiotic use. I, I can assure you 80% of antibiotic reduction can easily be achieved. Thank you very much. Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, doctor. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So I'm done. Yeah, Mike. Uh, we are able to hear you. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. for this presentation. Uh, we'll have questions regarding this presentation after the end of the next uh, talk. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have our uh, next presentation by Dr. Kirti Bhushan, uh, Madam. We can't hear you properly. It's not audible. Am I audible, Madam? Not very clearly. Okay. Madam, is it better now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's better. It's better. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Kiti Sabnis, madam. She is postdoctoral fellow in infectious diseases from CMC Vellore. And she has been a former assistant professor in CMC Vellore. She is currently working as an infectious disease consultant at Fortis Hospital, Mumbai. And uh, she has been uh, uh, chairing this uh, antimicrobial stewardship for Fortis Kalyan and Mulun. And she is additional faculty for general infectious disease at CMC Vellore. She has several, uh, several publications and book chapters, uh, uh, chapter in API textbook of medicine to her credit. So uh, I welcome ma'am and I just hand over the session to you and you just continue the presentation.
Uh, is my screen clear? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I at the outset I thank so Lapur Urology Association, a very enthusiastic crowd on a such a busy day, which is a lot of things happening around. Uh, and uh, I really thank Dr. Agarwal for a wonderful talk. Actually, it's like uh, thinking from an ID and infection control perspective. It was really good to hear you. And uh, now uh, it is uh, this when I prepared this talk, I had a discussion with Dr. Pankaj and I really had to think like a urologist. Uh, if your patient has a fever, what we should do? So uh, I, I'm just giving an outline because uh, this entire topic um, is case based and uh, the decisions also will be made depending upon your clinical situation you are in. So what, what are we going to see next uh, 20 minutes or so uh, is fever. What are the causes of post-operative fever? How do you syndromically approach uh, for uh, decoding the cause? And what are different therapeutic algorithms you can follow? So the fever is uh, above 100.4 uh, in a perioperative time. It, the causes can be infectious or non-infectious. Before, uh, like this literature is around um, na uh, around early 20, 2000s, uh, when the, the, it was considered as non-infectious fevers, I generally have lesser or lower temperature spikes and uh, higher temperatures can uh, uh, can uh, remotely say that okay this might be an infective causes for the fever but it's not always true uh, this is uh, from urology 2021 uh, in which they uh, commonly uh, denote the causes of post endourological procedures so we generally broadly divide the causes into infectious and non-infectious uh, generally the infectious causes are uh, if they occur within first 48 to 72 hours, which is not very common, are generally intravascular device related infections. Suppose your patient is on a center line for some other reasons, the patient is immunocompromised. That's a most common cause. Very emergent cause and not very uh, paid attention is C. difficile infection, uh, which can itself mimic infective syndromes. Uh, prostatitis, uh, remote accesses, uh, and UTIs, post endurological procedures. These are the common infectious causes. Uh, Non-infectious causes are actually commonest in for 70 to 72 hours. And the commonest cause is atelectasis, DVT, pulmonary embolism, drug-induced, malignant hyperthermia, uh, and alcohol withdrawal is actually very much uh, not much attention paid cause for post-operative non-infectious causes of fever. So uh, UTI is actually not a very common cause. It's less than 2.7 to 3% of endourological procedures. And uh, commonest causes still are non-infectious for uh, initial first three days. So let us uh, try to decode with the case. A uh, 60-year-old man with post-TORP uh, was hypotensive, heart rate was 110, shifted, was still in the uh, ward not discharged uh, because he was post-operative day three, was shifted to ICU because of his low BP and uh, tachycardia, required a non-invasive ventilation, uh, also uh, continued to have high-grade fever, uh, required a brief uh, uh, inotrope support too. So uh, this was his labs. Uh, uh, WBC initially was 20,000. Uh, urine culture was negative. Blood culture was negative. Uh, on uh, fourth, sixth post-operative day, his blood culture was positive for MRSH, the methicillin resistant staph uh, hemolyticus. Uh, his 2 day was normal, but continued to have fever, and was his non-invasive ventilation requirement also was not cut, coming down. Um, multiple antibiotics were added because he kept on having fever and was uh, in SIRS. I will not say sepsis because his inotrope support was stopped on the second day. Um, a diagnostic test was done uh, on his sixth post-operative day. This was his culture, uh, which was sensitive to uh, Vanco, which was resistant to uh, penicillin. Ampicillin was resistant. Ticoplanin was sensitive. Amoxicillin clamic was resistant. So it was single blood culture. So this was his antibiotic prescription. How many of us still agree uh, that um, he was in sepsis? How many of us think that this antibiotic choice, which is most of the times which we see in um, our ICU patients was correct. So this was his X-ray on sixth day and this was on day two. So uh, with this, when, when this case is given to an ID physician, how do we think? So this is 
syndromically a post operative patient within a week of surgery actually it became symptomatic on day 3 4 within 72 hours of surgery and uh, wbc count is eventually getting normal if you follow the time table and his all cultures are negative if he is septic not in sir it's not like sirs but if he is septic his cultures should come positive and within 3 days his wbc count is coming down so uh, the first important is we as we see um, the infective markers the single culture for mrsh is not significant because it's not a common uh, pathogen it's a skin contaminant uh, it's a single culture uh, percutaneous culture not from the line and even if it is from the line still i will definitely repeat it so these are the thoughts when an id physician sees a patient so his ct pulmonary angio was done Uh, on the sixth day, which showed a segmental pulmonary artery embolism, and he was initiated on therapeutic anticoagulation, and fever resolved in next forty-eight hours. So, uh, can, are there any red flags which can tell us these patients can have post-operative complications, can have uh, post-operative increased chance of having fever? So, John, this was from a twenty twenty urological society, but this was urological surgery, but this uh, population i will say it was slightly biased because it was including mainly geriatric patients about the age 60 it was a retrospective study in which the uh, multivariate analysis which showed a possibility was actually post op a positive pre operative urine culture as well as uh, bmi on a higher side and if operative time is higher than an r uh, was uh, predictive of causing Uh, post-operative complications for fever or SIRS. Uh, another study, which was around 2018, uh, had in that 3.8 percent patients had uh, infective complications, and the pre-operative uh, predictors of having infective complications were bacteriuria, hydronephrosis, and um, any uh, prolonged urological procedure. So. how to diagnose because as we have lot of differential included uh, whether we can have any algorithm or any time table which we patients can which we can predict whether it is infectious non infectious because that will reduce an anxiety amongst the treating treating surgeons as well as the relatives so uh, yes we have few pointers but they are not absolute uh, what in first 3 uh, days 72 hours no uh, even the number of the study is small there are multiple studies on the same uh, uh, discussion generally uh, first 3 days the causes are mainly non infective uh, might be the commonest are atelectasis dvt pulmonary embolism like our patient had after 4 to 5 days uh, the infective causes mainly that also pertaining to non neurological causes like respiratory bhagre ne aur pure piche piche lagai kya honu bhi kaise can we unmute the uh, so uh, after five, after uh, cut off of four days generally the commonest is respiratory infection not the urinary tract uh, and um, that is also if the patient is has multiple comorbidities like diabetes post transplant likely to have uh, healthcare associated or pneumonia more likely after that is Uh, line related infection and after that comes urinary urinary tract infection that is around 29% so uh, generally day 4 and above or 5 and above more likely to suggest infection than earlier fevers first or within first 3 days fever so that's very important uh, this is uh, algorithm what normally i use when a case is presented to me with a post endourological infection is day of post onset of surgery any local or clinical examination signs urine culture prior to surgery gives a lot of insight how, how was the surgery whether it was prolonged instrumentation whether there was a big stone whether there was already pre operative any cultures positive for any invasive fungal those also help in determining uh, whether it is an infectious cause or non infectious cause also very important uh, is commonly we uh, focus all our attention to infectious Hello. cause i can am i audible yes madam you are audible uh, so uh, we also always focus on our uh, attention to urinary tract infection or respiratory infections but we also have to have a high index of suspicion for other than urinary tract infection how it helps we'll see with one more case Um, 65 year old herpetologist uh, came with fever altered sensorium 
had recently got discharged post RIRS for referral stool. So uh, had high fever, chills, headache, vomiting, had one day of altered sensorium and myalgia. Uh, he was he's a herpetologist, so he was bitten multiple times by snakes, venomous, non-venomous, but nothing in last three months. There was no difficulty in passing urine, no low urinary tract symptoms. This is according to the relative who gave the history because he was in altered sensorium. We could not get a, a better history in at this episode. So uh, his saturation was normal. He's 102 fever. GCS was 11 by 15. There was no focal deficits. His chest was clear. You know, he was saturating normal uh, with a normal response. So, on investigation, his WBC was 9000, platelet was slightly low, had um, hepatitis, uh, chest x ray was normal. So, uh, um, eventually, because he was altered sensorium and uh, uh, because he also had uh, high grade fever, his CSF also was done, which was not suggestive uh, of any, because the glucose was high, not suggestive of any meningitis. Eventually, his uh, dengue serology came positive, IgG was positive, IgM was negative. So, uh, this gives an emphasis on differentials of acute febrile illness in tropical. So, normally fever with rash, we definitely look into dengue, meningococcal, malaria, rubella. So, this he typically had a red color rash. Um, but definitely fever with rash, we need to have a differential diagnosis with a short duration fever with a normal WBC count. So he had dengue with moderate uh, thrombocytopenia. Eventually his platelet dropped post-op endurological procedure. But very important clinical insights were no urinary symptoms and he had a normal WBC count. And he never required any inotropic support. There was no, it was SIRS, but there was no evidence of sepsis. So can we use biomarkers? Because this is very, when, when we discuss from a urology perspective, it is like, it's very fluid, uh, whether it is infective, non-infective, because both the cases, WBC count was eventually normal, patient's blood pressure was maintained. So should we wait until the blood pressure f fall to say that it is sepsis, uh, which we might not get a window every time. So can we use any biomarkers to decide any empirical antibiotics? So these are the, this is the data which is extrapolated from sepsis, sep surviving sepsis campaign and uh, SI, dif how we differentiate between SIRS and sepsis. So yes, the biomarkers which can be, there are multiple lists of biomarkers which can be used. The commonest use are procalcitonin, CRP, complements, interleukin 6, 8, 10. So uh, there are guidelines, uh, as we uh, don't note here, these are mainly from critical care uh, perspective and studies, uh, whether procalcitonin-based uh, therapies help uh, for infection and sepsis. So uh, procalcitonin can be used for, uh, if the clinical syndrome is not fitting into, can be used for uh, diagnosing whether there are infective syndromes or not. But procalcitonin-based therapy for escalation and de-escalation of antibiotic uh, uh, um, doesn't have much uh, longer benefits. So this was a subgroup analysis in which uh, PCTQ was higher PCTQ was associated with increasing uh, antibiotics or discontinuation of antibiotics. Uh, it doesn't have the mortality benefit. So PCTQ can help you to differentiate between uh, infective and non-infective syndromes. It's like a D-dimer, positive, higher, but higher the value doesn't mean more sepsis or higher value, serial values going up doesn't mean that you will keep on adding newer antibiotics uh, to it. It helps in de-escalation de or uh, keeping a negative predictive value for infections, but not for escalation of therapy. So the same which was in surviving sepsis guideline 2016, it can be used for discontinuation of empirical antibiotic use, but have limited evidence for uh, giving uh, infection uh, as a giving that as a marker for escalation of antibiotics so how to how do we treat the post operative fevers very important uh, it's to make a diagnosis it's very important to obtain sterile body cultures sterile cultures blood cultures we generally don't believe on sending catheter tips uh, culture swab or tips 
uh, we have to treat the patient so we have to get multiple data points when we diagnose between infectious and non infectious fevers or post operative fevers not only uh, uh, fever but we have to take into account wbc pctq chest radiographs multiple cultures and overall patient stability before making a diagnosis of sris or sepsis so, uh, so this is a very uh, common scenario that lab informs when your patient is sick in the ICU, lab inf informs there is a GNV growing, gram-negative bacilli in the urine. So how do we treat? Uh, we get a sensitivity. Uh, it is uh, resistant to cefepresone selbactam and sensitive to all carbapenem and amikacin. So which one to choose within, between carbapenem and amikacin? So we normally, as an infectious disease physician, we choose to a narrower spectrum and uh, for a uh, adequate duration. So I will come to it. What are the adequate duration and what are narrow spectrum antibiotics? So patient, Im we chose artapenem. Patient improved in five days. Uh, SIRS improved, sepsis improved, was shifted to ward. Now he has a difficult IV access. So can we change to oral drugs like oral ferropenem, which can be an alternative to IV carbapenem? So that's a very commonly asked question to an ID physician. So here is the answer to this. This was published in 2022. Two, uh, in which there were uh, only four actually RCTs, majority of were uh, non-randomized clinical trials, and one was retrospective chart review uh, for uh, comparing between ferropenem and other oral uh, other oral carb carbapenems with uh, carbapenems IV, which are been available. So it clearly says uh, inadequate and non-supervised use of ferropenem can cause cross resistance to carbapenem. So overall, ferropenem prescription in treating infectious disease data is very limited and definitely it can't be used as an alternative to carbapenem. So it's a very important uh, in our, uh, at least what is Mulun and Kalyan, we don't have ferropenem available as an uh, inpatient pharmacy and OPD pharmacy also it is available only with uh, culture report and in specific syndromes, definitely not for urinary tract infections. So how to choose an arrow spectrum drug that depends upon a urinary excretion as well as previous and current culture sensitivity report. So always we choose narrow spectrum. So if we go for E. coli, uh, generally we uh, choose amikacin and artapenem over meropenem if all are sensitive. So uh, this is what the normal dictum we follow. Uncomplicated pyelonephritis treatment duration will be five to seven days. Complicated pyelonephritis without bacteremia minimum duration will be 10 days with documented culture clearance after stopping antibiotics for 48 hours. Bacteremia with pyelonephritis and no additional focus and no emphysematous pyelonephritis, it's generally 14 days. We always document culture clearance in complicated or emphysematous or bacteremia, both blood and urine culture we need to document. Any uncomplicated cystitis. Uh, seven days uh, of oral therapy uh, can be sufficient. So uh, how do we prevent? Part, part of it is, has been already covered. So uh, sending preoperative culture or doing a dipstick urine uh, method, which one is better? Obviously, urine culture pre-op has uh, more value than just doing a dipstick because it will tell us the species and the resistance. Do all our patients who are going for an endo urine uh, urological procedure need a urine culture actually the data sways more towards uh, sending a ur urine culture or at least documenting that the urine culture is negative this is mainly because we have uh, as we have already discussed we have almost um, 60 percent of community acquired ESBL that means our 60 percent of the patients coming to OPD will have uh, ciprofloxacin or uh, uh, carb up, uh, extended spectrum uh, beta lactamase resistance uh, to the, uh, for commonly used first of uh, third and fourth generation cephalosporin. So it is mandatory to document if they have resistance so that our post operative care, if they go into sepsis, will be uh, given better. So, but majority of this data of using urine culture pre operatively is again retrospective. We need better data to say that uh, definitely it helps in post operative outcome of the patient but in our hospital uh, we do send our endo urological procedures uh, a urine culture definitely prior to the procedure and this is my last slide so this is the general dictum if you don't know where you are going any road will get you there so we definitely need to know what are we treating with the syndromic approach 
then only it will have a better outcome with a lesser resistance impact on our ecology uh, and using minimum antibiotics as possible. Thank you, and stop sharing the screen. Thank you, Dr. Sabnis, for a very good talk. Uh, well, uh, I request both of these speakers, Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Sabnis, to be present because I'm sure all of us will be having a lot of questions. Uh, now, uh, may I start with the first question? Uh, my question that has come in the chat box is that if the yeah. green culture shows sensitivity to multiple antibiotics. Now, I think one thing that is very clear from this talk, should we take home, uh, is, there, is this a take home message that prior to doing any endourological procedure, be it TRP, urethrorhinoscopy, RIRS or PCNL, it is mandatory that we undertake a urine culture. Ganendra, your audio is very poor. Yeah. Is it better now? Yeah. I think the mic direction is an issue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it mandatory to undertake a urine culture prior to any endourological procedure? Yes. Now, the reason is... Um... As uh, already been pointed out, the chances of multi drug resistance is very common in our community. So uh, uh, having a, a culture positive, so our uh, our uh, antibiotic can be directed. And if you have a culture positive, but asymptomatic patient, so um, you can start. You can do the procedure uh, with 24 hours of uh, antibiotics. Although the data from PGI, which is maturing now, uh, Chandigarh. So um, even 24 hours of pre-operative uh, antibiotic cover is not required. Uh, at the same time, if you have an ESBL, or maybe uh, we are getting even CROs now, carbapenem resistant organisms, so you can direct your therapy accordingly rather than uh, uh, treating it uh, uh, empirically later. In cases who are uh, sensitive, I mean, sorry, uh, who have a sterile culture, so you are reassured uh, to some extent and you can use antibiotic based on the patient class. Uh, although the ESBL uh, is very common in our community, but still there are markers for high risk, like uh, uh, and you can categorize as per uh, NABH document, we can categorize patient into category A, B, and C, like category A is a young person with no comorbidity and no antibiotic intake in last three months. I would like to add one more parameter, whether the patient uh, whether the patient is a non-vegetarian. Because in India, non-vegetarians are more prone to have ESBLs because animal husbandry is a major source of uh, multidrug resistant bacteria because of uh, uh, too much use of antibiotic. Then the class B is those who are uh, high risk, uh, some sort of immunosuppressed or any antibiotic intake in last three months. So the chances of ESBL is higher. You can give antibiotic accordingly. And class three is those who have been hospitalized in last uh, three months or visited uh, with or without visiting the ICU. So those with the highest possible risk for ESPL or even CRO to some extent. So uh, doing culture, I think uh, it has to be the norm and uh, it will guide us uh, uh, to the appropriate antibiotic uh, protocol. Mayank. Hello? Can I, can yes, sir. Me? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Sanjay Deshpande. Sir. Um, uh, sorry to ask a very fundamental question. Sir. Um, see, in practice, right, patient comes uh, for surgery. Sir. In fact, we have uh, two, three microbiologists sitting in our own audience. Hmm. And uh, we send urine for culture and sensitivity. Hmm. How, how long it takes before we get an answer for this? Uh, sir, actually, it will not be a culture. It will be a routine microscopy and culture. That is, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, that is, that is understood. That is. Mm, because I, why I emphasize this? Because I, I possibly think what you're getting at, yeah. uh, in case you have an excellent 
nicely done urine duty microscopy which is normal the patient is low risk so yeah. do we still have to wait till culture or can we proceed yes so in that case uh, uh, with a guarded approach i would say in a in a low risk patient in whose urine routine microscopy is normal yeah uh, one can proceed with the uh, procedure with an empirical antibiotic now which empirical antibiotic depends on the patient class that's what i uh, feel dr kirti wants to say something uh as uh, i uh, my doctor actually mayank is saying which is point is very valid uh, although we say that uh, the urine uh, routine specifically nitrate and leukocyte strays can predict whether there is any urine additional urinary tract infection or not but the studies which have which i discussed just now has actually swayed more towards a urine culture than only relying on a dipstick method because there can be 20 to 30% chance yeah. that the dipstick is so, not showing and uh, the culture can grow yes ma'am so after admission should we wait for 48 to 72 hours for all our patients sir, keep, keep them so i would i would more? say we should not admit <laughs> if there is yeah, no emergency, we should not admit only. There Why to admit? Guidelines also say that. And if it is emergency, we'll go ahead with the surgery anyways. Planned surgery, and if you are doing transurethral, at least screen for MRSA, VRE, AS well producers, and MDS. That's the newest guideline which I went through. Because that, if you detect these preoperative. Just, just okay. mic, mic okay. closer. We are not able to hear. Okay, so I just, even the newer guidelines which I went through, if you are doing planned surgery and it is transurethral, it is better to screen for MRSA, VRE, ESBL producers and MBLs. Then you yes. will know exactly what you are dealing with. That is the guidelines. So all this takes 48 hours? Yes, 48 hours. It so all takes... Full report for maximum is 48 hours. I think you can definitely wait if you are getting a better response when you have any one of these. What's the opinion of the house? But in practice, it is... Uh, okay. I think all our elective surgeries, we should not... Uh, yeah. Fix okay, the OT okay. without we have uh, the adequate information. I think that that's a fair statement. Absolutely. Uh, as a corollary to this, a patient asymptomatic but has a large calculus, whether he is being taken for RIRS or PCNL is a different story. Urine culture comes positive and it shows an organism. First, what would be the choice of antibiotic and how long to give the antibiotics before one undertakes a surgery? So that that would depend on uh, uh, whether the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. Asymptomatic. And uh, for asymptomatic bacteria urea, a 24-hour uh, pre-operative antibiotic is sufficient. And then that has to continue for three days post-operative because asymptomatic bacteria needs to be treated for three to five days uh, if any intervention is done. Which antibiotic to be chosen would depend on uh, the culture. A simplest uh, antibiotic, which is which that culture allows, uh, should be given an antibiotic which has good penetration into the urine. Bactericidal, not a static. We will not choose yeah. static. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, may I ask our microbiologist to give their views on the choice of antibiotic, especially when it comes to a narrow and broad spectrum that Madam was alluding to. Hello. May I have? We always suggest go for sensitive report, whatever narrow spectrum we go ahead. It, if the uh, particular organism is resistant, when the stone is there, we have to be very careful with the proteus. We, even the guidelines say that if you are having a stone, if you isolate proteus, you have to be very particular about choosing the organism. And the antibiotic. For the choice of antibiotics, you have to, uh, for empirical cho choice of antibiotics, you have to rely on the uh, antibiogram, that is the institutional or the personal hospital's antibiogram. So accordingly, we can choose the Actually, empirical yeah. antibiotic. Yeah, and that empirical. I said the presence of stone because it harbors the bacteria. Stone harbors the bacteria. Also. So E. coli, Klebsiella, and Proteus are the most commonest organism isolated from 
the limitation of uh, hospital based antibiograms is unless they have a good opd based data then uh, uh, we all know that uh, the community has about 60% of esbls then what about uh, uh, the hospital uh, suppose we are having antibiogram of only in patients so it will be really skewed towards uh, falsely having a very high resistance right. unless you have a community based data because many of these patients will be coming from rightly right uh, from the community so if we just take this uh, antibiogram hospital in patient then we will be landing up giving uh, carbapenems to almost everyone or at least uh, uh, cefepirozin sulbactam or uh, some sort of extended beta lactamase uh, uh, inhibitor uh, uh, this thing so we should have uh, uh, a community based uh, uh, antibiogram for community based uh, surgeries and or short of that we we can categorize as i mentioned we can categorize our patients has the patient been exposed uh, to antibiotics how is the patient immunity status where does patient comes from and then we can guide our uh, antibiotics for uh, empirically antibiotics for a culture style patient ma'am uh, how long it takes to get uh, sensitivity after doing culture uh, culture 48 hours it takes nee everything together both both together 48 both together 48 hours so there ma'am i will ask the microbiologist there are some chemi luminescent assays and other assays which can give uh, culture within 24 hours so are this are they in vogue or uh, i mean uh, i mean in lucknow we don't uh, have such in chandigarh we used to have a lab which would give uh, final report in 24 hours they used to have some sort of a chemi luminescent assay based on the uh, bacteria's uh, uh, other properties and in pune I, he- i heard that sensitivity is given in 6 to 8 hours is that it's right? called bactec method if i'm not wrong special methods uh, uh, rather than growing the bug directly we yeah. if you lawn the urine and apply the antibiotic so you will get the primary sensitivity without knowing the bug uh you can just make out whether it is a gram positive or gram negative bacillus okay uh, instead of instead of growing the organism and then making the suspension and learning it and applying the antibiotic what we can do we directly learn the uh, uh, urine and we apply the antibiotic so we can get potentially the result in 24 hours then no less than that i think uh, we oh. need 10 to 12 hours Yes. But but the problem is standardization will be low compared to the uh, conventional culture and sensitivity technique. But uh, okay. you, you you will get the idea whether the bug is sensitive or resistant. And this mm-hmm. will make mm-hmm. it also important for CROs if we have uh, that yeah. we will need to have a detailed sensitivity if we have a carbon. See, for random for early early, early diagnostic. So, madam, excuse me. Even with primary, what you are suggesting, advantage is if you have multi multiple organisms, we'll get the combined susceptibility pattern. Only the limitation of that method is we are not able to identify. Plus, we don't know what is the uh, expected results, and we don't have comparison. Like, are we getting semi-confluent growth? Are we having the correct inoculum? That we don't have. So I think waiting for two days. waiting for two days if we can is the safest bet yes, yes always hello yes sir dr maheshwari wanted to say something i think yeah dr maheshwari sir yeah what i wanted to say was that these rapid tests they would help you identify the bacteria these are newer tests which are based on the genetic uh, uh, say uh, uh, footprints of the bacteria local bacteria but they will not give you the resistance pattern so you will get the you will get to know the name of bacteria within 6 to 8 hours but for resistance pattern you still need to wait to forget us so what sir is uh, what the microbiologist colleague is saying that uh, instead of first identifying and then uh, impl- uh, uh, i mean what learning that uh, on the plate they can they what they saying they can directly learn it on the plate and uh, that results can come within 12 hours without knowing the bug so uh, the sounds interesting and actually is welcome if it's standardized because that will take care of lot of waiting for culture uh, hello this is dr jyoti chirgukar microbiologist from ashwini hospital uh, yes ma'am am i audible yes 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 ma'am very well uh, so i would like to just uh, narrate this uh, 
whenever we get any patient of UTI or pre-op patient for uh, um, for a surgical uh, uh, any type of surgery like TURP or anything, uh, we need to study as you already mentioned that pre-op culture is important. Uh, but before that, uh, clinical pathology is uh, m mandatory. Uh, as you already mentioned that whether the uh, the uh, pus the cells or uh, infection is uh, pre uh, is already there in urine uh, by simple microscopy or some biochemical testing and later if we were, we are going for cultures as uh, dr virend has suggested if lawn cultures is possible for that we need to do some uh, gram staining to see whether it is sing, um, single microbe or um, multiple microbes are there, whether it is contaminated by con uh, collecting, is it really clean catch urine, uh, midstream urine, so all these things, or uh, delayed transport to hospital, so many factors are there which may grow contamination and better we should avoid uh, such that if we are suspecting multiple microbes in that particular urine after gram staining and in that case we have to go we can reject the sample or we if at all we are going for culturing uh, within 48 hours we'll get the uh, uh, report after or or nowadays there are certain uh, um, new methods which will genomic methods where we can detect uh, these uh, uh, ESBL and uh, um, CRO, we can detect directly by genomic method or MALDI-TOP. We have certain uh, technologies like MALDI-TOP, which will give us earlier report after seeing whether the co colony count is significant, whether the whatever we have grown, they are not contaminants or not multiple flora. Only if two organisms are grown and amongst it, at least one is more than 10 raised to 5, we have to process with that uh, uh, microbe as thinking as infective one or pathogenic one. And then we have to proce uh, proceed for the antibiotic sensitivity, either manually or with uh, uh, automated methods like Vitek or any other available method. And um, or Maldito or we can go for genomic uh, identification of certain genomes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That's a nice summary. Uh, clinical situation, uh, we are undertaking a procedure, maybe doing a PCNL or RIRS or a ureteral endoscopy, and the patient is having chills on table. And I would like to know the opinion of each of the intensivists present as well as the uh, panelists. What would be your strategy of approaching it, uh, Nirman? So if I'm not mistaken, it is like the patient is on table for RIRS and is having chills. Correct. Hello. Yeah, yeah. patient is undertaking, you know, the stone is being broken and the patient is having chills. Yeah, but we will have this indicates again it gives an emphasis on the pre-op cultures. No, so what was the pre-op culture will direct sterile. us the antibiotic. If the cultures are sterile, then uh, the stone formers are generally, as we already know, are generally proteus, uh, E. coli, Klebsiella. So it, it, that also again depends upon the hospital ecology. But our overall community acquired uh, gram-negative pathogens are ESBS, sixty percent, as I said. So it is. It will be prudent to broaden your antibiotic cover and take a, a fresh sample uh, during the procedure. Uh, so broaden the cover means I will obviously uh, because it's sixty percent resistance rates uh, with chills. Chills indicates pyrogens, possible bacteremia. So I will definitely like to cover with the broadest cover that is carbapenem. And once the patient is stabilized, we can deescalate when we have better information. And for uh, I have one more point here that uh, Dr. Sharma allows. Uh, if the patient is done under, uh, if we are not anticipating infection and the patient is under spinal anesthesia, then chills uh, can be present uh, to a patient who is under spinal anesthesia because of uh, vasodilatation uh, below the level of uh, block. Mm -hmm. So that can be passed off as a, uh, and the warmer takes care of it. But if you have any other doubts, I would say that uh, uh, take a culture and stop the procedure.
हेलो हेलो या वी कैन हियर यू दिस इज डॉक्टर निर्मल तापरिया आई प्रेजेंट आई प्रैक्टिस एज एन इंटेंसिविस्ट इन अश्विनी हॉस्पिटल सोलापुर द फर्स्ट एंड फॉरमोस्ट इज uh if a patient in the operation theater gets chills during the procedure it need not be uh an infectious cause there are certain in non infectious causes like Absolutely. sir mind sir had said it can be hypotension it can be vasodilatation it can be nothing but uh, uh, decreased temperature in the uh, in the theater OT basically the theater. then if you if you are having a suspicion of an infection suppose a stone is bro broken if a stone is there in the urinary tract we believe that it uh, there is some sort of infection with the stone especially if it is a long standing uh, calculus so uh, as we take urine cultures before the procedure and we give antibiotics to the patient i think uh, if the patient is not hemodynamically compromised or if the patient is not having any risk factors any chronic disabilities or morbidities we continue with the same antibiotics and as the culture comes or if the patient worsens then uh, we can proceed with higher antibiotics because stopping the procedure only with chills and uh, again re uh, postponing the surgery and uh, doing surgery at a later date i think uh, we we are doing a lot for the chills okay No, if you really suspect infection, like uh, you break a stone or like when you are you have a blood interface that is uh, interacting with the bacteria, uh, and considering you have to look at the hemodynamics, chills, rigors, you get a rapid fever. It's a situation-based decision either to stop or continue with the surgery. I think common sense should dictate that. Yeah. Uh. excuse me in in cer certain other procedure suppose we are doing a local ind procedure or a deep seated infection we are draining some pus most of the times because of endotoxemia patient can have chills during the surgery or immediately post surgery so at that time i don't think if we touch the needles of the infection or if the patient gets transient chills without any uh, other features uh, i think the procedure can be continued because patient is already under the antibiotic covers Uh, sir, actually, there is a difference between uh, uh, doing an IND and uh, doing an endourological procedure because um, uh, the dictum of endourology is if you have any suspicion during the surgery, you stop the surgery first because in IND you are releasing the pressure first, releasing the pressure uh, of the microorganism. In endourology, you are actually increasing the pressure. You are causing bacteremia, which was not there earlier. So there is a, I mean, uh, I think IND and uh, um, uh, this endurological procedure cannot be compared. And if you have to compare this endurological procedure with IND, it will be like doing a urinary diversion and stop it. So if you find any dirty urine, just do a PCN or a stenting and stop it. That is the IND equivalent of uh, endurology. For endurology, if we are doing a clean, uh, clean contaminated uh, prepared planned surgery. and you find you think that this uh, chills and rigors is because of infection stop it uh, put a stent come out there is nothing lost but the patient will be certainly lost if you continue with the infected chills in endourological procedure because the amount of bacteremia endotoxemia and cytokine burst will uh, will really uh, if it takes the patient's life i i don't think that's a good idea if you consider that there is a infection and uh, the chills is because of infection you continue and your logic is said no uh, sir i have three questions the first yeah. question is what is the end point of treatment of emphysematous pyelonephritis when will you stop treatment when we have treated very sick patient by stenting or uh, putting uh, drain and he improves sepsis improves we have discharged him on opd basis the gas shadows are getting narrower they are disappearing but still present after this happens after several days of uh, discharging also then uh, how do you approach in this do doctor i'm already sweating at your question <laughs> because there is no standardized answer to it so what is uh, our practice because the gas shadows will take time to resolve from per from the pcs they will resolve very quickly from the parenchyma they will resolve very quickly 
but from perinephric fat or or in the paranephric fat if they have gone they will take time to resolve so we uh, in practice we don't chase uh, uh, till all the gas is gone because you will have to keep doing the ct scans uh, that way so the the uh, our practice at least is that uh, the minimum duration of antibody will be 14 days it may increase if there is any residual abscess so abscess has to resolve number 3 Uh, we follow these patients up initially uh, pro calcitonin but uh, for a inflammation uh, we will follow them up with the c reactive protein if the c reactive protein starts falling uh, with the half life which is uh, 19 hours and uh, 14 days has uh, finished then uh, we may consider stopping the antibiotic uh, but that's highly individualized decision so uh, while you were uh, speaking up i was thinking in my mind of three patients who are still coming in opd and all all three of them whose kidneys have been saved but we still don't have that uh, end point so at some point we have to um, stop because these patients have got their crp is normal but there are some gas pouches still in the uh, in relation to the kidney so we have stopped antibiotic for uh, those patients and focus is on improving the immunity because the crp is have fallen and they are falling uh, uh, at uh, at the rate of their half life The What treatment the... duration actually of emphysematous is pyelonephritis also depends upon the organism which you are looking at. Suppose mm-hmm. if it is a cervical pyelonephritis, then I might need to continue. Like we have a current patient right now, we might need to continue some kind of an oral suppressive therapy. Versus if it is some like a multi drug resistant klebsiella, which we don't have any oral alternatives to give. So that is uh, we can't generalize the treatment. It will be highly individualized and depends upon the underlying immune defect. The patient is highly uncontrolled diabetic or post transplant. Uh, then I will be really skeptical to stop at fourteen days. Sometimes we have given twenty one days with the suppressive therapy, continuing if the immunosuppression or the suppose the diabetes is not coming under control. We have given a suppressive therapy for six weeks also, which because. um uh, the crp also takes time to fall or even the crp is because they are immunosuppressed so the crp might not be a reliable indicator and definitely pctq based therapies as i have already mentioned uh, will not give us the entire picture so as dr agarwal said correctly it is a tailored therapy and obviously it is a team approach uh, do you do follow up uh, urine cultures for such patients to document that they are sterile uh yes for candida we definitely do for mdr pathogens we definitely do but many times you will find that uh, uh, these mdrs are there because typically these patients will have foreign bodies yeah. so the next focus after uh, treating the emphysematous pyelonephritis is to look into the cause of that emphysematous pyelonephritis uh, like whether it is a stone whether it was papillary necrosis so that the next focus would be that because uh, unless you remove these foreign bodies or the cause of that uh, infection you will keep on getting those cultures and you don't treat those cultures if the patient has become asymptomatic after that initial intensive treatment what uh, dr sapneesh is saying so culture with the idea of doing the in- next intervention but not uh, chasing till it becomes sterile because it will become sterile again it will become positive hello uh, mayank sir and our microbiologist uh see so we get lot of diabetics with these infections uh, but in practice we don't send uh, uh urine for uh, uh fungal cultures should we send separately or what is the sir what what uh, i i'll just tell my urology perspective uh, but obviously yeah. the microbiology would be a better person so what we do in such patients is we send these uh, uh, t- uh urine for uh, routine microscopy culture gram stain koh and rapid cro these five things are immediately done and uh, candida will grow in uh, even uh, in the bacterial culture i don't know uh, i really don't know how the microbiologists uh, uh, do it uh, they say that uh, uh, if their candida is growing they will give in the same culture they give the candida in the same uh, culture report uh, maybe the microbiologist okay. can shed more light on it so on the same day we can know that whether we are dealing with gram negative bacilli with or without fungi or gram positive so and uh, whether the organism is cro or not uh, so that we can tailor the antibiotic immediately on the same day uh, most of the time we get candida only uh, and candida can be very well grown on bacterial uh, culture plates cultures in 48 hours 
sir and, uh, yeah with absolutely grams, with gram stain also we can make out uh, we can make out the yeah, yeah, budding is sir yes sir correct uh, second second question is how do you uh, sterilize ureterorhinoscope yeah so uh, sir uh, sir uh, i can tell my institute's uh, uh, practice and then i will tell a very practical approach also yeah. in my institute uh, uh, we are blessed to have ltsf sterart uh, all these things so all our scopes go for uh, uh, ltsf or uh, uh, plasma whichever uh, the csd department accepts suppose we have number of cases beyond the capacity of uh, sterilization so then we use a, a, pr a product called gigasep pearls it's similar to parasep but somewhat different uh, i don't know the chemical which it uses it also is uh, prepared every day so uh, my focus is which are personally para yeah parasep is an excellent agent yeah. so we have to uh, wash we have to scrub uh, the nurses have clear instructions and we keep on doing uh, surprise inspections in between whether they are brushing the channels they are cleaning the instrument properly and then uh, after drying putting the uh, whole instrument inside that uh, tray and flushing the channel with the uh, uh, sterilizer using and waiting for 10 minutes minimum all the uh, we keep it practically more than that so that uh, that is a uh, 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 to me it's a very acceptable so way of parasite is good enough yeah yeah parasite is awesome sir what Par parasite Cydex? is very good sidex so sidex um, uh, it is a good agent no doubt for a high level disinfection we need a very good pre cleaning scrubbing uh, of the instrument before that and the biggest problem of sidex is that a surgeon has to be honest while using the sidex yeah sidex is there is no hard and fast that sidex will uh, we use for 14 days and suddenly on 14th day something will happen and sidex will uh, become bad so sidex is maximum period 14 days and there are number of cycles uh, recommended uh, for sidex there are uh, strips available whether the your sidex solution is uh, still uh, uh, effective or not and fourthly we have to give it time i have seen people uh, you dip in sidex 10 minute are nikalo nikalo wash karo use karo it is uh, wrong way of doing it we have to clean our trays before next uh, making of sidex otherwise the biofilm will form and these patients who will get with that one occasional patient who will get this uh, non tubercular mycobacterium will be in a soup for the rest of their lives uh, uh sorry Uh, i would like to add uh, uh, certain points in uh, disinfection disinfection by sidex because i'm Sir. sure in our area sidex is widely used Sir. almost almost 100% hospitals are using sidex only Sir. Uh, so sidex uh, uh, the main thing is uh, 14 days is shelf life as we know that doesn't mean if you are doing 8 to 10 surgeries per day and 8 to 10 times you are putting your uh, scope in the sidex and still you want to use it for 14 days without yeah uh, without, absolutely without monitoring the efficacy of that sidex because if uh, if some hospital is having one or two surgeries per day and that person is also using for 14 days and the 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 hospital which is having 10 surgeries per day that is also using for 10 days 14 days uh, for that uh, uh, the strips are available and monitoring is needed i think if your load is more you should uh, monitor more frequently number 1 number 2 if you are having 10 or more number of cases it is it is better to have two sets of uh, scopes so more that two, yeah. enough time is given for the disinfection otherwise what yes. will happen the uh, most of the uh, uro uh, uh, endoscopic surgeries are of 15 minutes or 20 minutes you may not get the cleaning time as well as disinfection time Uh, enough uh, for the proper disinfection so i always uh, suggest for those uh, hospitals to have two uh, uh, scopes label or one and two and use alternately so that the enough time will be given for the disinfection absolutely sir and sidex is toxic it is carcinogenic yeah. uh, and it is toxic to the environment we should not forget that and for people who are uh, 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 who have high turnover uh, number of cases the economic sense also does not make uh, uh, any sense anymore because if you are making a solution every day versus you are keeping for 14 days uh, it is only for small number of cases so when the large number of cases suppose you have to change your sidex 
uh, every third day. If you have to change your statics every third day, you have to change your statics every third day. So that doesn't make any economic sales also, sense also. If you're honest to your uh, this thing, because hospital will say, "Can you wait four days and go?" But uh, uh, as a doctor, we have to be honest that we have a good turnover. And uh, if we have a good turnover, then that three to one difference of cost between Parasafe and Sidex will fizzle out. In fact, sometimes Sidex will become more co uh, costly. Now, now, man, when to use ETO? Sir, uh, ETO. Um, Especially for flexible, is it applicable? Yes, sir. Uh, because ETO can penetrate plastics, it can penetrate uh, thin channels. But yeah. the problem is that ETO has a long cycle. So suppose you have one yeah. uh, uh, flexible and uh, you have done ETO to that, then how much is the relevance? Because uh, once you open it uh, and you put it the other ETO, you can use only next the other day. You cannot use it on the same day. So ETO is useful only when you have many uh, ureteroscopes. And yes, you are uh, using... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair enough. But it is better than uh, Zydex and Parasif. Equivalent. Not... Uh, sir, uh, I, I would say... They, uh, so there are... Uh, the study which I showed, it showed that uh, uh, the ETO uh, has a, a more reliable sterilizant capacity, which is marked by a, a marker called SAR, sterilization something uh, ratio, which is one in a million. So one in a million is achieved only by these gases. Uh, the chemical, even parasafe, uh, does not achieve one in a million mark for sterilization. So obviously the sterilizant, it is better. But practically speaking, if you have done a mechanical cleaning properly, we have flushed yeah. our channel with the whatever. So then parasafe is uh, good enough for uh, practical number of cases. Unless you have many scopes, then, then it's a different uh, choice. Hello. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is to uh, Dr. Kirti, ma'am. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, uh, uh, sometimes we see that post-procedure patient comes uh, in wards or ICU, the cultures are positive and we start some antibiotic, but the patient eventually, uh, after some uh, duration, maybe four or five days, he stops responding to the antibiotics. Patient starts worsening again. Repeat cultures don't help much. And as you say, uh, non-infective uh, causes of fever, if we do extensive investigations, are negative. Or in other words, if the patient is not responding to the fever and antibiotics, uh, what are the measures we should, which we should take? And second, uh, uh, interlinked question is, when should we start antifungals, uh, whether there is any role of empirical antifungals in such patients? Because when the patient is having multiple comorbidities like diabetes, immunosuppressed, it really gets difficult even when we follow the cultures. Yeah, uh, I got your point, but the, the, it's always the diagnosis and the treatment which we decide is syndromic. So if you think that the patient is continues on a broad spectrum antibiotic, which is given according to the culture and patient is still spiking, that there are two things again infectious and non-infectious causes if the patient is not clinically deteriorating in terms of pressures blood cultures are remaining sterile in this definitely the biomarkers will help you because if there is a negative pctq that will definitely rule out an active infection cause but if the pctq is positive that will not tell you that the infection is increasing so uh, then empirical antifungal uh, if you are deciding about a non only for the urological causes uh, i will suggest uh, we i will hear also there are multiple biomarkers available before deciding an empirical antifungal choice because antifungal when you start if the patient improves uh, with some non infectious because you don't know whether the antifungal were really required and how long to give and they are potentially toxic drug and they have a lot of collateral damage for causing antifungal resistance. So there is a separate thing called as antifungal stewardship. So I will not recommend to start antifungals if the patient remains uh, febrile for more than three days just like that. We can use biomarkers like beta D glucan and galactomannan uh, before starting these antifungals, which will tell us at least when to stop or whether there is definite fungal uh, anything invasive. Actually, fungal in the sense this is very broad uh, terminology, whether you are looking at candida or aspergillus as an invasive uh, disease to the patient. We are talking only about a uh, urological because there are uh, your patient, if it is immunocompromised, is likely to get invasive fungal disease somewhere else like lung. So, the, uh, candida according to the disease uh, related with the lines, if there are a prolonged lines. So, the, this we are not uh, taking into account. Uh, 
and the blood uh, urine culture as i said your routine urine cultures will grow we don't need to have a separate fungal culture if you are dealing with candida so we should rely on a, our uh, uh, correct sampling and uh, waiting for the cultures before we decide to add on multiple antifungals and antibiotics uh, yes uh, my question to kirti madam madam how will you approach patient of candiduria asymptomatic and one who is admitted in icu with foley's catheter multiple lines and he has candiduria and fever no other source of infection apparent so candiduria is obviously uh, depends a lot on host if we are dealing with an asymptomatic candiduria in a normal host i will first definitely look into how the sample is collected whether the sample has been collected properly from a, a, a proper new, newly inserted catheter or it's a sterile urine which has been sent because candida is a very common superficial colonizer in lot of icus that actually talks about uh, not well controlled infection control that's a different topic but definitely i'll take it with a pinch of salt if the patient is asymptomatic candiduria if the patient has obstruction and the urine culture is growing candida alone as a single organism and the patient is not improving on uh, multiple antibiotics i will uh, take it as a true pathogen with an obstruction associated first definitely we have to relieve the obstruction and uh, treat according to the cultures uh, which come for candida so candid asymptomatic candiduria as an id physician i'll always take it with a pinch of salt rather than blindly report re believing on the report and in um, non albicans candida isolated in urine in symptomatic patient which drug you recommend actually now we have a lot of uh, candida uh, non albicans candida also mainly glabrata which is a common uh, the data is from pj chandigarh again is a very Im emerging pathogen so uh, I, I, i will definitely urge to get an antifungal susceptibility which is a well standardized even in smaller setups uh, More definitely insulapur will be there and then until i know the sensitivity i will start on fluconazole but definitely i will ask for a sensitivity because what happens this is a very common error which happens because initially as and as a bacterial sensitivity we get it automatically done in a bacterial culture we have to ask specifically for a antifungal sensitivity so not always the fluconazole will work um, specifically for non albicans candida like glabrata where we have lot of resistance So I will start with fluconazole, but definitely ask for a sensitivity. Yes, madam. Last question: Will you recommend uh, treating a patient of asymptomatic bacteria who is uh, planned for total knee replacement? I get many such patients. What is your recommendation or practice? Uh, it's actually very common. Uh, uh, um, Uh, problem we get a lot of patients who are having uh, uh, surgery on non neurological intervention for which a symptomatic bacteria is positive and generally if your infection control is good and patient is non like not a immunocompromised the immunocompromised now definition includes uncontrolled diabetic also so if the patient is not uncontrolled diabetic i will not treat that uh, symptomatic bacteria i will use it as a marker if the patient goes in sepsis what i can i can use it as but definitely i will not treat it because that will again generate more and more colonization and resistance yes true but in this case we will be inserting foley's catheter surgeon will insert foley's for at least few days it is a invasive procedure then ideally it is to be recommended this is what i feel there is no recommendation yeah, but, uh, if it is a cro then we will end up in patient giving a meropenem and colistin which will be more problematic with with lot of drug interactions and potential nephrotoxicity so the and we will further we will when the patient gets for next 3 months if the patient gets in uti will be definitely resistant to either meropenem so if it is uh, according this is uh, with the idsa recommendation and even the urological society or symptomatic bacteria only two indications to treat is endourological procedure and a pregnancy because that is associated with worse outcome a peri uh, peripartum otherwise we don't treat Thank you. Uh, hello i would like to add something uh, we uh, talked about eto uh, and about the uh, disinfect uh, disinfection actually uh, for practical purpose uh, disinfection with uh, as either cydex or paracef is a practical approach as uh, about the cost we are concerned we know uh, cydex we are using but uh, sparingly we have to 
uh, monitor the um, capacity of that uh, uh, side X by using chemical indicators. Without that, we shouldn't uh, continue to use the side X. ETO, of course, it has good penetration, uh, but the, uh, it is toxic and uh, we have to do aeration, sufficient aeration. So it takes long time, like 14 hours to uh, complete the cycle and only if many or multiple uh, instruments we have, we can go for ETO. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, we talked about, uh, we are talking about urosepsis and we have not talked about blood culture. Uh, though we have, we know that whenever there is a UTI, uh, especially in persons who are um, having risk factors, they may proceed. Almost 12.3% uh, uh, studies show that uh, uh, patient proceed to urosepsis. Uh, so we need to go for blood cultures, though uh, not all, only 33% of the blood cultures are positive in case of urosepsis. We need to go for urosepsis so that we can know whether further continued fever or prolonged fever is because of uh, sepsis um, or what, uh, or uh, SIRS. So uh, we need to go for multiple um, blood cultures or blood culture sets, at least three blood culture sets we have to collect, uh, aerobic as well as anaerobic, uh, depending upon the situation. Thirdly, about candida. Uh, I think we know that colonizers, many uh, candida, uh, candida species are colonizers. So especially those with high risk patients like diabetes and um, on, uh, immunocompromised patients. So multiple uh, cultures are advised. And if repeatedly same uh, candida is being isolated, we have to go for uh, sensitivity testing, which is rightly available in Solapur. Uh, and uh, nowadays we are finding um, or isolating candida auris also, which is uh, really a great problem in uh, uh, ICUs. So we need to take preventive cares more than um, treating to avoid the candida. All the uh, catheter care uh, measures must be taken in ICUs, especially or all, all sorts of catheter uh, patient. And nowadays we are seeing Providencia group, which is multi-resistant, is being isolated quite, a, uh, quite often. Uh, what is your experience about it? Dr. Mayank, you can uh, throw light on this. Uh, Ma'am, irrespective of the organism, uh, Providentia specifically, I don't have any comment. But uh, for CRA, uh, when we get, so we use uh, Iloris now as a first line, as a carbapenem. Um, uh, obviously, carbapenem alone cannot be used. And times with the function in a sick patient. And basically, Hello. You are not audible. Hello, Dr. Mayang. Anyways, we um, have seen and have the references that this Prudentia, once it is isolated in ICU, it spreads yes, very rapidly amongst the uh, immunocompromised patients. So we have to take care that index case uh, should not occur in our ICUs also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mayang sir, are you audible? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but my question to you is, I just want to know about your experience in uh, post-PCNL uh, atypical mycobacterial infections. Okay. So, we get, as I told, every second or third week, we get one patient uh, coming from it. Typically, the history is uh, discharging sinus uh, from um, the PCNL site which started a few days after the procedure. And uh, the CT scan, uh, we get the CT scan done. It typically shows that nodular ill-defined mass lesions, which is right from the skin, reaching up to the surface of kidney. So we, um, uh, we take these patients for, you can say, wide local excision. Uh, have to make a big incision and, you know, um, uh, excise that affected the skin 
go till deep till the kidney surface excise the whole tissue send for cultures and empirically in consult with our pulmonary medicine department start on uh, anti micro uh, microbacterial typically these are resistant to pyrazinamides and uh, the uh, what i've seen the trend of our uh, pulmonary medicine they will start with the um, arsenex ethambutol levofloxacin linezolid sorry uh, uh, levofloxacin and clarithromycin and uh, wait till culture or till response and based on uh, that they will uh, 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 change to i've seen uh, microbial uh, our pulmonary medicine person for a recurrent case they have even given um, Septomycin injections, septomycin, yeah, no, canamycin uh, uh, injection, or uh, linozolid, sometimes meropenem. So that's the whole uh, problem that we don't know which organism. Till now, I have not seen any organism growing so far in whatever cases we have done. In fact, we are planning to write a series also. But um, I think wide local excision helps uh, in these patients. But I really don't know about the long term. Um, uh, maybe microbiologists or ID specialists can throw some light on. which anti mycobacterial uh, should be the first line in such cases so actually for atypical mycobacterial we should not treat empirically because they are never an emergency we should as it and the dictum goes by a, a good surgical cure we have had a few post transplant patients not done in our setting but having a post transplant also they do have a, a tract with the atypical mycobacterial and there are a lot of drug interactions when the, mm. these cases of patients are presented so few cases we have just got away with doing a good wide local excision and waited for the uh, culture to grow if the culture doesn't grow and because there are a lot of drug interaction sometimes we have just given them aminoglycoside by monitoring the uh, creatinine and they have done well so uh, it entirely depends upon how good surgical Uh, you clearance you do uh, that is the prime importance and we get lot of drug resistance because of uh, empirical choice people suspect a typical mycobacteria and give combination of, of linezolid clarithromycin and amikacin because most of the times it works so i will strictly prohibit people to give empirical drugs for a typical mycobacteria unless you have a good sensitivity if the culture is coming negative and if you have done a good excision then only you can try giving empirical drugs but if there is no good surgical cure uh, blind only adding an antibiotic to antibiotic will no, so uh, you you mean to say that if you have done a good surgical wide local excision then we can just uh, uh, not give any uh, anti mycobacterial mycobacterial treatment sometimes it's it's depends in room wise like the patients who are post transplant one or two cases actually we have no, not uh, let's not let's talk about this scenario let's uh, talk about this scenario what doctor has asked post pcnl uh, uh, tract sinus which has nodular uh, infiltration ill defined nodular infiltration right to the surface of kidney so suppose we have done a, a wide local excision so should we uh, proceed with the empirical um, anti mycobacterial uh, mycobacterial treatment or we can just we should just wait because uh, uh, till now i haven't got any positive culture so far in any of the cases no so what should we do right positivity is around uh, 40 to 50% so half of your case cases uh, will be positive half of the cases will be negative and that no, the positive in our rate... situation it has been like 100% negative never got any positive culture so far no it that also depends upon what was the previous antibiotic therapy and when we have taken the patient for excision so normally these patients as i said these are not emergency cases so if you stop hmm. the antibiotics and take them after 10 to 15 days the yield is better typically One. typically these patients will come uh, after several months of uh, this thing some or the other antibiotics see they typically they would have done some culture some secondary organism would have grown so typically our patients uh, come once they receive a lot of levofloxacin and lot of linezolid yeah. so your tract culture should grow if this patient is off antibiotics for 10 to 15 days it, it never mind if it is not growing we just yeah. need a combination of an aminoglycoside uh, with a a, a, a typical culver like clarithromycin azithromycin and uh, either a higher generation quinolone so, so that levofloxacin means so that means so that means you will give uh, empirical uh, antimicrobial even if you have removed it yeah but awaiting the cultures yeah of course My because we but do what is, we have to take cases, because it is pan resistant yeah i think uh, i think it's right uh, 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 it's a ongoing discussion and uh, 
we can Ma'am, it's a food we'll for probably thought need to as of today cma on this particular topic it's a, yeah, yeah, topic yeah. And a growing uh, topic i Sir. think considering the constraints of time i will just end this session with two last questions one by dr apurva shastri and after which i will request dr pankaj maheshwari to give his expert comments and give a take home message uh, dr apurva yes sir thank time. you i am from rajasthan sir uh, i just wanted to ask uh, the use of formalin chambers the formalin tablets versus the sidex and sir, also how many times should we use these op- open end cat open end catheters have, and glide wires how many times can i have already for, one case? for formalin chamber as i mentioned my listing and i have uh, in the chat also have responded formalin chambers are just to be condemned that's all they should never be used it is an extremely poor choice extremely poorly managed uh, with no standardization only toxicity that's all so okay. formalin chambers is a completely no no never okay the second question yeah. that he has asked me is about reusing ureteric catheters and guide wires so reusing uh, uh, so we uh, if we have a good method of resalizing so i don't think there is any problem in reusing the ureteric catheter how many times you can use depends on the status of the catheter uh, the guide wire if you are using terumo guide wire which we commonly use it loses its uh, glideability after one or two uses so it depends on the situ- from situation to situation okay but if we use sidex for open end catheters and glide wires then we can use until they are usable yeah i guess Cut. Okay. Okay. Man, I think no, you, like, let's not like, give this as a message. I would feel that you see things like ureteric catheters, which are not really expensive, uh, and very difficult to clean. Why reuse them? Uh, yeah, I I fully agree with you, sir. Uh, so the yes. rider proper cleaning, and uh, if that is not possible, just throw it away. Exactly. And you know, I have seen places where even when they eat or sterilize it, it comes as jalebi. Okay, they coil it in a small packet and give it to you a coiled ureteric catheter. Yes, and it is not possible to straighten it. <laughs> to use it, so yeah, yeah. Let's reuse things which are really expensive and are going to make a big dent in patients' bill. But things like ureteric catheter, I see no logic of reusing them. Absolutely, I agree with you, sir. Fully agree with you. Okay, thank you, sir. Pankaj, Pankaj, can I uh, take? this opportunity to invite you now to give your expert comments yes. and give a take home message at the end because i think yes. that is the first time i have heard all that all the panelists and everybody the speakers have been passionately involved and it's a topic which probably entails involving a complete one or two days cme it cannot be completed in a matter of an hour or two yeah over to you pankaj I I really feel uh, uh, say underpowered if I can use that statistical term to give a expert in this CME with uh, Kirti Madam here and me giving such good uh, insights. Uh, I would all say that a uh, few small practical tips. Let's not be in a hurry to uh, do the surgery. Let's evaluate the patient properly. Always do a culture. be willing to stop the procedure at the first opportunity if you get you go in even with a pre op sterile culture and find a purulent urine do not try to push and do the surgery there is a, if you can always fight tomorrow let's not die in the first battle uh, let's go slow first opportunity count stenting is a very good procedure no patient will be very unhappy with you if you stage the procedure but one in even 10 15 20 patients if you land with success you will have a very very stressful time managing such patients uh do not use antibiotics for every pyuria that you get uh, many times patients who are on stents catheters they will have uh, significant pyuria and to treat them with antibiotics probably would kill uh, i would go to the extent of saying that do not rely on every culture that you get look at the culture and really try to fit it in in your clinical picture means we have recently done a study you are aware about that where in the city of mumbai more than 92% patients do not get perfect instructions for collecting a culture there are so many wrong things which are happening as far as culture collection is concerned where uh, there is a 
uh, there is a home collection of culture now obviously a person who goes to somebody's home is not going to collect that culture in a uh, ice pack will not go immediately to the lab and get the sample and like within 2 hours so this sample was moving around the city of mumbai in the heat and really getting incubated and uh, you will grow bacteria in such uh, situations so uh, look at every culture if it is not fitting in your clinical picture look whether look at it whether it has been properly done uh but uh, be cautious and think before prescribing antibiotics it is very easy to write antibiotics for 5 days but it will neither prevent your infections uh, and do more harm to the patient than good uh, i think uh, that is all i would want to say that's a nice sum up sir thank you bhai Yeah, then you like, want to add something? No, no, nothing. Sir. It's, it's it's like vote of thanks. I'll uh, thank you all the our speakers. It was wonderful session indeed, and uh, thank you to Kirti Ma'am, uh, Mayank Sir for uh, taking out time and having such a wonderful interactive session. Pankaj Sir, as always, you are there. Uh, I I still remember when I I was there at Fortis, and he was always there. He was always supportive in every aspects. and uh, i am uh, thankful to all the our uh, panel consultants from our in house uh, microbiologists our physicians for taking out time from their opds and uh, coming on last uh, uh, this thing and uh, I, I, i i try to conclude the session yes and my uh, sir and submiss ma'am i we hope ki you will be a part of our uh, uh, next sessions uh, uh, whenever we will have uh, regarding urosepsis thank you thank you thank you